Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Friday, April 3rd, and we are continuing our uh, consideration of S3. And uh, this morning we'll be working with legislative council. Uh, we don't have any witnesses scheduled. And uh, we're looking at draft 4.1 of S3, um, which is also on our committee page under uh, Legislative Council Eric Fitzpatrick's name for today, for those of you who are watching on YouTube. And um, 4.1 represents a um, combination of the recommendations from the um, other committees that have, um, have uh, t taken testimony and contributed to this bill, um, as well as we as a committee have, um, um, have looked at and um, talked about thus far, although we have not taken any formal votes or straw poll votes on those, those sections, but they primarily represent what we've heard consensus on from our witnesses. So um, with that, um, welcome and thank you, Eric. Sure. Hi, good morning, everybody. Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council uh, here to um, do a quick walkthrough of the version 4.1 that you have in front of you of S3, which is an act relating to competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense. Uh, there are very few changes between this draft and the previous draft, so I'm going to move pretty quickly. Uh, I think it's all going to be pretty familiar to folks, but I can refresh your recollection uh, briefly as to what's in the bill. So uh, starting right away with uh, version number 4.1, again, the highlights show Actually, you've got two different color highlights. Uh, the yellow highlights are showing the changes uh, between the bill as passed by the Senate and what the, this committee has so far got in there as changes. Um, the blue highlights show changes that uh, have been made between the previous draft and this draft. So as you'll see, there's very few of those because there have been very few changes, other than the fact that Section 6, which is the Forensic Care Work Group, does not have any very few highlights because it's really, you can't do a highlight to show the changes in that section. It's completely rewritten. So um, it's just the new language from the House Healthcare Committee draft that the committee had looked at last week that's now been inserted in there. Um, but uh, don't, don't, be, um, don't be distracted by the fact that there's very few highlights in there because that doesn't mean there haven't been any changes. It just means that it's a whole rewrite, so couldn't really do it that way. Um, so having said that, let's start from the beginning. Section one has to do with the initial uh, psychiatric examination, or in some cases, examination by a psychologist that's required when a criminal defendant raises the issue of uh, competency to stand trial or sanity at the time of the offense. So just uh, quickly moving through, you'll see where some of the yellow highlights are. We went through this last time. This language clarifies that uh, sometimes the exam is done by a psychiatrist, sometimes by a psychologist, uh, depending on whether it's uh, an examination of the person's developmental disability, in which case it would be a psychologist, otherwise a psychiatrist. Uh, when that exam is done, the report, um, a copy of the report is provided to, you'll see additions here to the respondent, that's the criminal defendant as well as Dale, because they are involved in these developmental disability cases. Subdivision two there uh, is the one that the committee has been discussing. No change is proposed as of yet, although uh, we may get to this after this general walkthrough as to uh, possible changes to this subdivision. And this is the sequence issue uh, in those cases where the psychologist and psychi uh, sorry, the psychiatrist and potentially the psychologist are asked to provide opinions on both competency and uh, sanity, this section specifies that uh, they're going to be done in separate reports uh, so that they're not combined into one report. Because as we've talked about, these are separate issues. They're not the same thing. So it makes sense for them to be conducted, the examination to be conducted separately. And it also specifies that uh, the sanity uh, examination is only done if the person is first found competent to stand trial. Again, the idea being that a uh, person uh, would never be able to raise a sanity defense if they weren't first found competent to stand trial because the sanity defense is only raised at trial. So, or 
beforehand, but with the understanding that the person's going to trial. So the person has to be competent for that to come into play. And that's why that sequence is proposed there. And uh, there's the new language added that um, uh, to uh, not to address the issue of potential loss of evidence uh, or memories not being as good later on if the uh, sanity examination isn't conducted till further down the road, say, for example, the defendant regains competency five years later, um, they're still instructed, the psychiatrist, I mean, even though they're not doing the sanity examination yet, to still collect and preserve any necessary evidence uh, so that later on, years down the road, if they have to provide a sanity uh, report at that time, they would still have that evidence there. They wouldn't have to go back and find it uh, uh, starting from scratch. Uh, so that's section one. Section two has to do with the hearing. Remember, after uh, if, if the uh, a person is found either incompetent to stand trial or in, uh, uh, insane at the time of the offense, there's a hearing that's held to determine whether or not the person is a danger to the themselves or others, and if they are, they would be committed to custody of either DMH or Dale. This language in sub B there clarifies that um, a copy of the report, uh, sorry, that, uh, that the person's entitled to have counsel at that hearing from legal aid, and that uh, both DMH and Dale are able to appear at the hearing uh, and call witnesses. Section three is the victim notification piece. Remember, this is after the person has been committed to DMH. Uh, so you're further down the timeline. This is a person who applies to a person who's already been committed before their, uh, at least 10 days before their status has changed while they're in DMH custody. And when I say their status has changed, I mean, for example, they before they would either be discharged um, from DMH custody or, um, or have their treatment level stepped down from hospitalization to non-hospitalization or uh, before their commitment order expires, if any one of those things happens or is about to happen 10 days from now, uh, then the department has to notify the state's attorney or the attorney general, whoever prosecuted the case, and then the SA or the AG has to provide notice to the victim. Same procedure would apply if the, if the person elopes from DMH custody, which essentially means escapes, flees. Uh, in that situation also notice would be required for the SA and the AG who would then in turn have to provide notice to the victim. Uh, you'll see the struck provision there has to do with that separate notice provision that has now been moved into the forensic care work group. And that's the, the different situation in which a person on an order of non-hospitalization in the community isn't complying with their order or, or uh, the alternative treatment isn't working. That's that whole concept of, as the bill came over from the Senate, in that situation, there would also be notice required to the SA and the AG. Uh, the proposed change here is to move that out of the statutory requirement piece and put it in the forensic care working group so that they can study uh, you know, what should be done in that situation and what circumstances should trigger the notice and what should the SA or AG do with the notice once they get it. So that issue will be looked at in the, by the working group. Section four is the, uh, the disclosure to the prosecution of the, uh, or sorry, actually the examination by the prosecution. The prosecution uh, currently under current law can ask the court for an order that the defendant submit to a psychiatric examination uh, in the case of, uh, where the defendant is raising a sanity defense this provision expands that to a competency proceeding. So when uh, a defendant is, when the defendant's competency is at issue in a criminal case, this allows the prosecution to also ask the court for a psychiatric examination of the defendant um, after the independent psychiatric examination has been done. Uh, section five. So now we're moving on to the reports and studies provision of the of the uh, amendment. And you'll see, remember, these are the two sections that the Department, the Committee on uh, Healthcare looked at. And this committee reviewed those changes proposed by the Committee on Healthcare and um, asked me to put those sections into this bill. So that's where we are now. We're still 
working from a House Judiciary Committee strike call amendment, but those sections from the House Health Care Amendment have been uh, moved into this version. So the first one is the assessment of mental health services that uh, the Department of Corrections uh, is contracting with uh, to provide for uh, person under DOC, persons under DOC supervision, and this requires DOC and the Department of Mental Health to do an inventory and evaluation of those mental health services um, that are provided by the entity for whom, with whom they contract. Uh, this language is, is uh, exactly the same as what the committee looked at last week. Katie walked the committee through the language. You'll see in this case, uh, I was able to use yellow highlights to show what the changes are between uh, what came over from the Senate and what is uh, being proposed here because it, although there were quite a few changes, the way it was set up structurally, it lent itself to being able to see what the new provisions are. So you can see that as it came over from the Senate, I'm um, in subsection C, uh, subdivision one, you know, the, the substance of the evaluation included that first part, comparison as to how the type, frequency, and timeliness of mental health services provided in the correctional setting differed from those um, that are available in the community. But then this these other pieces that are in yellow were highlighted, i sorry, were added uh, by the healthcare committee and agreed to by this committee. So all those other pieces are new. Katie walked you through them last week. I'm not gonna go through them all line by line, but it's just more substantive work that the, that the uh, uh, departments would have to do for purposes of this uh, inventory and evaluation. So assessments and comparisons of the mental health services, that sort of thing. You will see, um, so go down to subsection D, now this is highlighted in blue. Uh, you should see that in blue on your document. Now that's because this is something that this committee, after having reviewed the healthcare committee's proposals, uh, wanted to add. And you'll see it's the same concept as added in two places, but this is just an overarching requirement for, for the, um, the evaluation that's being done by the uh, Departments of Corrections and Mental Health under the section. For purposes of that entire evaluation, uh, this language applies and then says in conducting the, the work required by this section, which is the evaluation we just talked about, DOC and, and DMH shall ensure that social and racial equity issues are considered, including issues related to transgender and gender non-conforming persons. So that's sort of a, a broad, a requirement that applies throughout the, the work that's required by that section for evaluative, evaluating uh, their mental health services. So moving on to section six, uh, the, um, you'll see a couple of changes that are in blue here as well. This is what the, the, the committee talked about after having reviewed the healthcare committee's proposal. So this language is essentially the healthcare committee's proposal. And the first part, actually, uh, the first subsection, I should say, um, the changes were pretty minor. So I was able to use some yellow highlighting just to show what they were between the, how, the Senate version and your document. So uh, really just some, some language at the beginning, but a couple of key points. Uh, so this committee is added to the forensic care working group uh, representative from Dale, that's subdivision two. Uh, uh, the Department of Buildings and General Services was in the Senate version, but was struck by the House Health Care's version. I didn't hear any discussion of that during Katie's walkthrough, so I'm not sure if that was a conscious decision or an oversight. Um, maybe something that we'd want to follow up on. I just figured I'd note it. I, I really don't know. I haven't haven't asked Katie yet, uh, but I just figured I'd pointed out because it was in the Senate version and was not in health care, the health care committee's amendment. Before Eric, yeah. Maxine, is it okay if I ask Eric a question about that before we move on? Did this, do you remember why the Senate put buildings, um, why, why the Senate had them in there? I think it's because they were they figured it was a facilities you know this the related to a yeah. facilities question yeah. I think that was it yeah yeah I, I, I agree and I think because healthcare um, committee was concerned about you know about seeming like there's an assumption that we are going to have a new facility that that sort of came came through in the Senate or that was an interpretation that that came through in the Senate version. Um, I, I guess that's why it, it was taken out here, but 
but um, I, I made a note to follow up as well. So yeah, thanks, thanks for jumping in. Um, go ahead. And also right below that, you see this committee also added the added uh, the chief superior judge that was at, at Judge Grierson's request. He, he also thought uh, he should be on this work group as well. Um, you also uh, last time increased uh, the number of, oh, actually, I think this was a healthcare point. Uh, I can't remember that the increase in the number of crime from crime victims representatives, sorry, <laughs> and individuals with lived experience of mental illness uh, went from uh, in the case of crime victims representatives from two to three, and uh, and then for in the case of individuals with lived experience from one to three. So you see those numbers are bumped up a little bit in subdivisions eleven and fourteen. Uh, and and uh, the last thing, this is something I think, uh, Chair Grad, that you mentioned last time to add a representative from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. So they're in there as well. Right. Uh, I see Tom has his hand up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, just mentioning these crime victims kind of triggered something. Say if somebody, uh, uh, something happens and, uh, and somebody is uh, um, um, found um, um, insane, I guess. And uh, so there's, in a sense, there's no crime. If, if somebody is found that uh, they're not competent or, or, or the sanity, sanity issues. So, it, but there is still a victim. So is, is somebody still eligible or is there still help for them um, even though there's not a crime committed? Yes, the, the definition of victim in the victim statutes is broad and is brought oftentimes written broadly so that, for example, you know, sometimes the charges might get dropped, right? Or, or, or that right. uh, there might be facts that would um, uh, not lead to a criminal conviction, but nevertheless, a person could still qualify for a victim if they suffered a, a, a loss as a result of the defendant's action. So, um, yeah, that it is broad enough to include that. Great, thank you. Yep. So moving on uh, to the the balance of the uh, the forensic care working group, you'll see that's uh, from there on in. There's no highlights, but it's entirely that's just because that's entirely the House Health Care Committee's language that Katie walked you through last time. And it, again, there's a different structure of sort of phases of, the, of reporting. You remember they're gonna, the forensic care working group first does a preliminary report to this committee and the corrections and institutions committees, healthcare committees uh, on or before February 1st of uh, 2022. So that's the first stage of the report. And at that point they sort of identify uh, basically, the issues, the gaps in the current structure, opportunities to to improve uh, the structure, as well as the competency restoration models, um, uh, and it's at that point I think the sort of one of the main differences between uh, the bill that passed the Senate and the bill that, that or the version that you're looking at now is that they're uh, it's sort of set up so there's not yet a predetermined conclusion that a forensic facility would necessarily be required. Now, the issue is that it, this is being considered at this stage of the game. It may be that that's an advisable uh, uh, step, but it may not be. And this initial report would uh, start the ball rolling of considering uh, whether or not that's, that's a good policy. Uh, and then uh, if you move on down to page 13, it's based on the recommendations in that preliminary report. Uh, um, the department uh, then submits a, a, a second preliminary report to the uh, Joint Justice Oversight Committee by July 1st of that year as to whether or not a forensic facility, forensic treatment facility is needed. So it separated out those two things so that the initial analysis of the issues isn't sort of based on a uh, you know preordained conclusion that a facility is the right approach. Uh, and then um, second stage of that is, as I said, that would be by February of 2022. Then by July of 2022, a few months later, that's when um, uh, the departments would, would 
make a recommendation to uh, Justice Oversight about whether or not that's the right move. And it's phrased, I think, that way intentionally. That's on line nine, page 13, whether or not a forensic treatment facility is needed. I think it's phrased in that way. It's phrased neutrally. So um, it's, it's not suggesting that one conclusion is the right conclusion. So uh, it's up to them to make whichever recommendation they feel is the right policy at that time. So then uh, on or before January 1st of the following year, 2023, that's when the final report is due to uh, the committees of jurisdiction, this committee, HCI, healthcare, et cetera, that finalizes these recommendations, uh, including addressing the size, scope, and fiscal impact of any forensic treatment facility if one is recommended. So they don't take that step of addressing you know, the details of the facility, which were kind of in the, in the initial part of the step as the bill came from the Senate, saves this till, till uh, later on. It's dependent upon uh, there being a recommendation that the treatment is needed in the first place. Sorry, that the facility is needed in the first place. Uh, and that's uh, pretty much sums it up. You'll see, oh, sorry, on page 14, lines 13 through 14, adding a little language again, that this committee had talked about last time regarding, uh, uh, again, this is an overarching um, uh, direction to the forensic care working group. It doesn't just apply in part of their work, it actually applies throughout their work. You say, you see in line 10, in conducting the work, the work required by the section. So it applies broadly to all their uh, tasks that they are charged with completing by this section. They have to uh, ensure and subdivision A that social and racial equity issues are considered, including issues related to transgender and gender non-conforming persons. So that doesn't apply to any one particular piece of the forensic care working group's uh, mission. It applies throughout it to all of it. I think that was something the committee wanted to make sure. Thank you. I see Barbara's hand is, is up. So excuse me, Eric. Sure. Thank you. Um, keep getting in the habit of lowering my hand right away. Okay, so Eric, I know that it talks about gaps and needs for treatment, but it sounds like um, treatment facility gets its own billing and sort of a higher um, elevation than filling in the gaps for other treatment services. Am I interpreting that incorrectly? I didn't read it that way. Uh, okay. To me, it, to me, it's, it reads as uh, one option among many others, and commuting community treatment and various others. But that's really sort of, I admit that I think that's in the eyes of the beholder to some extent. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, because I wondered if one of the gaps that comes up is like supervised housing or something that's that is um, short of like an inpatient treatment residential option but we don't need to spell that out i mean it doesn't really say that it just it talks generically about everything else that's the way i read it yes okay thank you sure and uh eric i have, I have a question um in there in here somewhere is there a statement that um that the working group can have subcommittees I was looking for, is there something like that? Or, and if not, do we need to have that? Because there are a lot of people, this is a big group. I, I don't know. think I don't think that it's in there. And I also, I, I don't, it's not that you can't put it in. I don't think it's necessary. I don't, okay. I don't think, I don't think they're prohibited from having them, but you certainly, there's nothing wrong with spelling it out if you'd prefer to. I think it's, it's either, it's really your choice, but I don't think the, the way it's written, um, precludes them from establishing subcommittees if they think that would be helpful. Okay, great, thank you. Well, let's, um, let's, let's leave that then for now. That's fine, thank you. Sure, um, that pretty much brings us to the end. Uh, there's a, the appropriation of $25,000 for, for the work uh, at the very end that is also an addition from the uh, Senate version. Um, you also, so and section seven is new in its entire this, you remember, is the expansion of the, uh, the Justice Oversight Committee so that um, the, it adds the, uh, a a one more member appointed at large by the Senate and as well the chair of the House Committee on Healthcare. So expands that membership. 
Excuse me. Uh, Becca uh, Davis Drive. Yeah. Pardon me, sorry. sorry. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, Ken has his hand up. Go ahead, Ken. Oh, sorry. Can't hear you, Ken. Sorry, thank you. Um, hasn't it already been determined that we need a, um, a uh, I, I can't pronounce it right, Fresnac, uh facility? Hasn't that been talked about in detail? Uh, it's been talked about, but I don't think there's consensus on it yet. I would think that would be really, really important with everything that we're dealing with on this bill and everything and going back and forth, I, I would think it would be um, um, not even an issue that we need to, we need to have a, um, a uh, you know, being looked at and spending money for that. And I assume, and um, Eric, you probably can't, uh, answer this, but I assume there's no COVID money for that to help or anything like that. And I don't know who I would ask that to. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer. Sorry, Representative Gosselin, it might be uh, something for um, someone in JFO probably be able to uh, give you more information on that as to whether or not some of the COVID funds could be used for that purpose. Okay, Thank, thanks. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, can I, I? I agree that uh, certainly has been talked about, and this um, this draft from the, uh, especially the healthcare committee, does does give the opportunity to con continue that discussion. Um, so it's not ruling it out, but it's not making that assumption, and and that was something that was important to to that committee. But it's it is referenced in there. So, okay, thank you, Eric. Sure. Yeah. So, so thank you so much. So that, uh, any questions otherwise um, in terms of that particular draft? Okay, not seeing any. Okay, great. So then um, trying to think, Martin, I'll actually turn it over to you and then Eric can um, chime in if there are, if there's other language we should be look, looking at, but please um, refer us to um, the section that you've been working on and, and um, what the committee and others can be looking at. Sure, uh, the section is uh, on the latest draft 4.1, it's not in there, but just to orient you, it's on page two at subsection two, but uh, it, I separately under my name is the proposed amendment and I can kind of walk through as far as why <laughs> why this proposal, uh, it does, it, it tries to do, well, first of all, let me let everybody get to that first. Just nod if you're seeing the very colorful, multicolored uh, amendment, blue and yellow. We good? Is it on our page, uh, Martin? Yeah, it should be under my name. Uh, you may have to refresh. You may have to uh, like refresh the page if yeah, you opened it a little earlier. Because uh, Evan uh, added it not that long ago. Okay. So, so the, there's a, it's trying to do three things. And what actually one of them we've already seen. Uh, first, it's try, the first uh, point, and, and I'll turn to Kate to see if it actually uh, addresses what, uh, what uh, she, uh, she brought up, uh, is to, is in, in case um, the, these two exams are going to be conducted by two different uh, individuals, I, I think is what I'm trying to capture there. You know, if the court orders the examinations uh, of both of both of these examinations, I'm trying to make it more more general, um, and I'll let Kate uh, weigh in if 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 I captured what you were after or not. You don't have to weigh in right now, but uh, it, you, uh, so that's that's the first. The second we already looked at, and that is uh, 
preserving evidence, and that's what's in yellow. Uh, and, and we've already had uh, Eric uh, has talked about that. We've talked about that a little a little bit, and I think we've had folks weigh in, and uh, I think they're generally fine with that part of it, from what I understand. Uh, so, and then the third part has to do with uh, some input that we've been uh, receiving as far as making sure that the respondent you know, that we are trying to respect their wishes, we're trying to respect the agency of the respondent or the autonomy of the respondent and being able to actually uh, ask for both of these examinations to be occurring concurrently. Uh, and I, I, I took this from, though I didn't quite put it in right uh, or correctly, I should say, uh, from the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Standards on Mental Health uh, which uh, the language can be found among other places in the uh, letter we received from Will DeWhite on April 15th, 2021. Uh, that, that provided some of the guidance, but I, I put in an extra, an extra step of saying, well, first of all, let me read it. It says, notwithstanding subdivision A of, this, of the subdivision, it, uh, in other words, uh, if it's found to the individuals found to be incompetent to stand trial, the the subsection 2A says don't do the sanity examination, uh, although preserve the evidence. But this is saying, well, notwithstanding that, uh, the court may order uh, upon uh, motion of the defendant. Uh, and language that I still have a question about is I added and for good cause shown that the examination of the person's competency to stand trial and the person's sanity at the time of the alleged offense occur concurrently. Uh, I have further language that uh, based on some input uh, as far as protecting the defendant uh, at that stage in the, in the proceeding uh, from self-incrimination, making it clear that if the defendant requests that those examinations to occur concurrently, only the defendant at that time would receive the sanity examination uh, opinion or results, uh, at, at least until the person is found competent to stand trial. So the question I had, you know, what I added was and for good cause shown. Well, first of all, I, we sent, Evan sent this out to uh, what we thought were really the relevant uh, individuals to, to weigh in on this. We may still, from uh, input that we received from Jack McCullough, probably want to run it by the Defender Generals, uh, uh, I would think. Uh, Maxine, I'd defer to you on that. Uh, but uh, those... those... Okay. Um, and actually, Judge Gerson. Oh, okay, and Judge Gerson. Um... Because we are... Yeah, the court may sure. order. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So... But I, the responses, I, I believe Evan has uh, posted those, so you can see them uh, yourself. But essentially, the response uh, was favorable for this, except uh, not liking the and for good cause shown. And, and I think Jack McCullough and Will DeWhite and Ann Donahue all, I think, uh, expressed uh, why they didn't like that. And it makes sense to me. It's not a standard we need in there. The, so I've struck it in the uh, provision or that you, you are seeing now, there is one question that I would have for everybody, and that is if we want to uh, be closer to matching what the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Standards on mental health uh, provide, uh, instead of striking and for good cause shown, we would change the and to an or, because the language of the American Bar Association is uh, that the examination should not occur at the same time unless the defendant so requests or for good cause shown the court so orders. I'm, I'm fine not putting in or for good cause shown and just leaving it simply to the request of, of the defendant. I think that gives the most um, deference to the def what the defendant's wishes are in this situation. So I, I'm inclined to just leave it as I have here and striking and for good cause shown because I think even adding or good cause shown adds uh, some uncertainty as far as what we're talking about. What does that mean? I think it, it's pretty clear what it means if the defendant requests for it. You know, the court still needs to order it. I mean, that's, that's something that has to happen. Uh, but that, that's, 
that's kind of where I am, but I just wanted to flag that uh, for individuals and you know, for discussion. All right, well, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Martin, for taking the lead on this and thank you, Kate, for uh, bringing us <laughs> here in part. Um, yeah, I think in terms of whether it's and or or for good cause shown, um, given um, that Representative Donahue and others did not like the and for good cause shown, I'm not sure that or would be any more palatable. Um, so right, when we open it up to, so Kate, go ahead, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, first I just wanted to express my gratitude to the committee and Martin and Eric. Um, I know I brought this issue up multiple times and it may seem small, but I appreciate the patience with me and the willingness to incorporate different language. So that first section that was changed, um, I, I think looks great to me if, if others are comfortable with it. I just feel like it's more clarifying in my mind. Um, and I like all the rest of the language. I support striking and for good cause shown. I also personally kind of feel like the, the language that was added in terms of providing that the psychiatrist and if applicable, the psychologist shall collect and preserve any evidence necessary to form an opinion as to sanity. If the person regains competence, in my mind, sort of maybe addresses that issue. Um, like, like that information will already be gathered based on the stats statute that we're talking about putting forward. So if that helps me feel comfortable striking that section. Um, so yeah, I'm in support of the language and I, I appreciate the time that was taken on this. Great, thank you. Tom. Thank you. Yeah, one, one of the things I was gonna, gonna say is I wanted to hear from Kate, but I think we both put our hand up at the, about the same time. So, um, but, but yeah, uh, uh, I'm supportive of the new language and, and uh, also of, of striking the, the and for good cause shown um, the, the, the um, concerned people that, that took a look at it. I, I think if they thought uh, or was a good idea, um, you know, just looking at the, you know, thinking of the experience of the people that were um, that were looking at this. Um, I think if they thought or was a good idea, they would have, they would have put it in, but, um, so I, I would support taking that out and, and, uh, and again, support the new language. Let's see, uh, Bob, sorry. Yes, <clears throat> uh, Martin, under, I guess it would be B, 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 mm -hmm. Report on the person's sanity shall not be made available to the prosecutor and to the person who's found competent to stay in trial. Why would the report be available to anybody if, in fact, the person is not competent to stay in trial? Well, it would, it would, uh, the way that I think subsection B, and, and Eric can weigh in on this as well, is set up is that, you know, the defendant will, will have access to that. The defendant will receive that, but until competency is established, uh, it doesn't go to the prosecutor. All right, so, so nobody else really gets it except for the defendant. And I think the way that this is uh, supposed to be set up. Oh, but because it doesn't, doesn't really say that now, does it? It just says that it won't be made available to the prosecutor, which is fine. But I was just wondering why, I mean, and if uh, the individual chooses, I guess at some point. In time to make it so I, I guess I could ask uh, Eric if we should, you know, a, a different way of putting that is that the report shall only be provided to the uh, defendant uh, or the respondent, I guess, is the proper word language. Um, <clears throat> Eric, what do you think as far as, I, I thought it was clear just from the whole provision overall that it would, uh, you know, if the defendant is requesting it would go to the defendant, but maybe it would be clearer if instead of saying we're not going to provide to the prosecutor, we'll say that we're going to provide only to the defendant. I mean, we could add that and also say, and shall not be made available to the prosecutor. So it could be the report on the person's sanity shall be made available to the, uh, shall be provided to the respondent or defendant, whichever word, and shall not be made available to the prosecutor until the person is found competent to stand trial. I, I mean, have that. Or, reads uh, better. Yeah. 
I'm looking at Eric as far as how, if that's necessary or. I think that if you say it's only provided to the defendant, then it's not necessary to say that it doesn't go to the prosecutor too. Um, but I'd well, probably want to see it. Well, except for the competence part. I mean, the, the idea- No, no, is I mean, you're right. It, 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 you're, you're not mentioning competence. You know, okay. you're saying the report on the person's sanity okay. shall, only pro, shall only be provided to the defendant uh, until the person is found competent to stand trial. Right, right, something along those lines. Right. Yeah, that's the idea though. Thank you, thank you, Bob, for pointing that out. Okay, uh, Barbara. Thanks. So I, um, Martin, and Kate, very grateful for all the work. I feel like this bill is getting better by the day. Um, the or is something that I don't support either, unless it's like. I mean, if it were for a good reason rather than or a good reason, because if it's for a good reason that someone else is raising it, it might not be so good for the defendant just mentally to have to go through that. And um, I would be in favor of taking it out. So I would I would think if we could just uh, finesse that language, if Eric could finesse that language a bit as far as, you know, the report on the person's sanity shall be provided only to the defendant or respondent uh, and shall not be made available to the prosecutor until the person is found competent to stand trial. And if we could strike the and for good cause shown, and then we can get it out to uh, the defender and to the uh, Judge Grierson. Does that sound like a game plan? Yeah, and actually the same, the people that, that um, we already sent it out to because there are, are some changes. Okay. And uh, yeah, and see what, see what they say. And then I think depending upon what, how folks respond, um, at that point, I think we'll have a better idea of if we actually need them to come in and give testimony um, or if we can just go on their written responses. Um, yeah, certainly if somebody has a, a strong issue or, or something, it would be good to, to have them actually come in and um, so we could hear from them. That's uh, what I'm thinking. Uh, Bob, is your hand up from before? Or do you have another? Oh, just, just quickly going back to what Eric said and versus what Martin just added to it here. I thought, I thought Eric uh, gave us the impression that the report of the person's sanity shall only be, shall be made available up to the uh, respondent and or defendant and that would pretty much cover everything else, but Martin went on to add, uh, he's going to add that in there along with, and shall not be made available to the prosecutor. Well, it's, it's however Eric wants to put the language, but I think that's the concept. The concept is that <coughs> it's uh, available only to the defendant until the competency is, is established. And uh, I will leave the language wordsmithing to Eric. To, unless you have a question, does that make, are you, am I clear? Are we clear on that, Eric? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, um, it's one of those situations that we often encounter where uh, language may not be technically necessary, but you may want to have it for your comfort level. So it's really, it's really, I'm going to kind of put the ball back in your court because I don't think it, I don't think it's legally necessary to say and shall not be available to the prosecutor, but you may want it anyway, because maybe you, you feel like it's sort of, enhances your comfort level with the clarity. So um, either way is fine, uh, whichever. Yeah, so it would, it would say, you know, shall, um, you know, shall be made available only to the defendant. And then you could then include or not include the words and not be made available to the prosecutor. Well, yeah, and it's the, the key part of it is that until the person's found competent. That, that's yes, that would follow either one, yeah. Right, right. I, I'd like to. I'd like to be clear. <laughs> so, I'm I'm for the extra words and clarity in this particular instance. Yep, it um, works. That works for me. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Coach. Thank you. 
Uh, and also, uh, Kate and uh, Martin and Eric, uh, thanks for uh, getting us to this point. Uh, what I what I hear from the conversation, you know, is what we heard from testimony um, in in a number of different bills around interpretation uh, and the judicial interpretation. Uh, in some of the cases uh, that uh, people used as uh, 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 illustrating how uh, the different uh, ways that the judges would approach a particular topic, having as much clarity as possible in the statute leaves less room for interpretation that could be different than our intent, the legislative intent. Uh, so as long as we're not uh, complicating a possible decision, it seems to me any time that we can make a clearer statement so there is no question about where our intentions were, we're better off. And, and this seems to do that, or at least that's what I'm sensing. Yeah, and, and thanks for your point, Bob, because, you know, that helped, you know, uh, as well. But uh, just just felt I needed to, you know, put that out there. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Good. Good point. I. Uh, no. I. I agree. Okay. Good. Well, that. Um, I do think that this bill is is coming together. I appreciate everybody's work on it. So, all right. Um, we do have it scheduled at some point next week. So we'll we'll keep working on it. Um, before we adjourn, I'm going to just quickly uh, update. Committee members, um, so this afternoon we are taking up S99, which actually was just referred to us. Um, we're going to hear some very um, compelling, difficult testimony. We have um, victim survivors coming to speak to us. Uh, so just to give you give you a heads up. Uh, and then I we I just learned as we all did that we have a token session on Monday, and so I've been trying to set things um, up with council so that we can decide whether or not to concur with the Senate's work on our on our bills. So I'm not, I have to think through again if that impacts our timing. Um, I know on Tuesday we do have Bryn for use of force bill, um, H128 panic defense, which um, I, I'm hoping that we'll concur. Um, I don't think anything has changed and Selena can help with that. Um, I believe H199, Eric worked on, that was the, um, oh, the real estate bill, right? I think they just concurred with us. They didn't make any changes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So that one is okay. Um, so anyway, so let me, let me, um, I, I, it also depends upon when these other bills come over from the Senate and that, as of yesterday afternoon, that wasn't known. So I'll, um, I'll look at that but if we have to postpone for a day um, in order to determine whether or not to concur um, we can or I'll get creative <laughs> or something but to make sure that we all have the information that we need to um, to concur but I again I think the recommendations on 145 H145 and H128 will be to concur H18 um, which is the um, sexual exploitation bill that um, that Tom took the lead on, I think in terms of the Senate changes to H18, I think those sound, seem to be fine, but they did put on another um, bill. It is the bill on human trafficking that this committee looked at before. However, we will be taking testimony on that and um, Selena has been taking the lead on that um, because not all of us um, were here when we did that before. So we will take some testimony. Um, and again, I'm, I'm hoping that we will be able to concur with, with that. Maxine, with, uh, yeah. with those two being um, combined, will, will they need to be reported again on the floor? 
on any level or? Yes, so okay. yes, yeah. So um, so whoever reports it and, it, and it could be more than one member. So for instance, Tom, you might report the H18 part of it, you know, the original H18 saying that we concur with that portion of it and why. Um, and then you might want to refer to somebody else on the other piece sure. of it or, or, or report it, whatever, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what was going through my mind. Um, yeah. if, if we had to report it again, and I assume that, um, when we do the, the walkthroughs or take another look at it, that Michelle will be, be with us. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think we're doing that on, on Wednesday. Okay, uh, great. So it, so it may actually be that we're concurring with the Senate. But because that second portion um, is a Senate bill, there'll have to be some reporting on that. Right, um, right. The, um, the Good Samaritan piece. And uh, so Celine has been working on, on witnesses for that, which I appreciate. So anything else before we, before we adjourn for lunch? Did, 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 we, did we do the Good Samaritan earlier this year or was that last year? It was last year. Yeah, it all runs together, doesn't it? <laughs> right. It was. Yeah, it was okay. last year, and then it actually had a, a report on it, uh, but but the report is not part of um, part of our consideration. It's just right, right. The, just the Good Samaritan piece. Okay, and we had and we did do it last it. year. Yeah, we had a strong vote on that audit committee, didn't we? Right. So I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up. So okay, we did do it last year, but. But the we that are of this committee, <laughs> right? No, no, no. Last year, uh, last yeah, year's yeah. committee, which is it, right. Yeah, sorry, it, well, isn't a totally different committee, but is a totally different committee. <laughs> Let somebody listening figure that one out. Yeah, really. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, last year's committee had a strong vote, if I remember right. Correct. Thank you. It, Thank it, you. It was. It was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was unanimous. I okay, I thought coming out of committee, and uh, it was it was maybe not quite unanimous, but maybe unit. It was like nearly unanimous. Yeah. unanimous yeah. on the floor. Heading over to the Senate, we could go back and look at that vote, but it was it was a super strong vote. I think. Yeah. Okay, and and I, and, uh, I assume we'll be going. Yep. Yeah. I assume we'll be going over any changes that the Senate made or, or um, I, don't that think, so. I don't think they made any, uh, Michelle, the email I saw, Maxine probably, oh, okay. the email I saw from Michelle said so they adopted exactly the language. Um, oh, okay, so it'll be a review. Last year, so it's really tracks like exactly. I, I don't actually know if they included the study. I'll go back and figure it out. Right. It, it, right. Not, so it's just the immunity provision. Yeah, that's what I understood. But I think that tracks exactly to what we passed. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think it is great. And I think if there was any opposition on the floor last time, it was because of the study. Well, so, and Will was Will was the reporter, so you probably remember <laughs> better than I like what the floor support was like. Yeah, I and I, I think there was there was some on the floor, there was some concern about the Good Samaritan portion just because, you know, people are coming up with maybe plausible scenarios, maybe implausible scenarios on what we could let someone get away with because they reported or was someone going to report just to get out of a crime sort of thing. But those were pretty minor. Yeah, on the floor, the vast majority of the, the pushback and interrogation was in regards to the study group. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right, thank you, Will. So, anyway, so okay, yeah, and again, if anybody hears of things moving, also just you know, just please let me know because it's it is hard to keep track of it all. So, <laughs> anyway, but, okay, great. We will um, see each other.